Good evening, everyone. Thanks. Uh, I'm Nigel Duncan, um, and I'd like to welcome you all here to City Law School. Uh, it's great to be acting as the hosts for the Association of Law Teachers in the annual Lord Upton Lecture. So I'll say no more, simply hand over to Jess Booth as chair of the association to introduce our speaker this evening. Thank you, Nigel. Um, I'm not going to keep you long because clearly you don't want to hear from me. Because in a room where we're about to hear from William Twining, me rambling on is just going to really annoy everybody. Um, I want to share one tiny little anecdote with you which perhaps will explain how excited I am about William agreeing to do the lecture. Um, and that was when I was an undergraduate student at Leicester um, and this random text appeared on my reading list that sort of vaguely looked like they might have something to do with law. The people responsible for those reading lists are also in the room. Hi. <laughs> um, and I looked at this and I was just like, okay, now this looks interesting. This doesn't feel like the other kind of stuff on the reading list that had made me question my choice of degree. And a lot of that stuff on the reading list was authored by William Twining. Um, so I read lots of William's work really early on as an undergraduate student and then promptly forgot about it, but it probably made my law degree bearable. Um, and then I came back to it when I started doing legal education research and went, yes, this, this, this is why I started doing this. This is what captured my imagination. So I am really looking forward to my imagination being reignited, further ignited this evening. So without further ado, William Twining, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Well, it's wonderful to see so many friends and such a large turnout for a talk on this topic. I'm going to half read from an overlong manuscript because I've promised something a bit longer to the law teacher. Um, and the theme of my lecture is to give almost a narrative of a sense of dissatisfaction that I had about the way we talked and thought about legal education over the 60 or so years of my career. I first encountered law in its formal sense in 1952 in Oxford. My own belief is that we all encounter law in the womb and until and after death, if you believe in an afterlife. Um, and I have had this perpetual sense of dissatisfaction about our ways of talking and approaching and making policy, etc. But I retired from legal education, at least I tried to, um, in the late 1990s because I couldn't diagnose what was making me dissatisfied. So today I'm going to try and tell that story and using the metaphor of Becky Huxley Bins of light bulbs, which are used in a prior lecture, I want to go through fairly quickly some early light bulbs and then four more recent ones to get to a point where one at least can start to sketch an alternative way of looking at and thinking about this broad and complex field. I don't do PowerPoint, in fact I disapprove of PowerPoint, but I've provided an alternative to you in the form of a quite substantial handout that you may skim, occasionally refer to, read during the dull bits of the lecture, scribble on, which is one of the reasons why handouts are good, and then take home to ponder. Take it home as a gift to ponder. All of that is an improvement on PowerPoint. In preparing for this lecture, I read carefully several previous Upjohn lectures. 
This proved daunting, not only because H had an important message, but also my argument today might be thought to be challenging all of them by presenting a radically different perspective. But, having gone through them, I tended to agree with the thrust of nearly all of them. In 2012, Lloyd Neuberger was surely right in countering the view that our inherited system of primary legal education and training is not fit for purpose. I agree with the proposition, even in a radically changing situation, there's much to be proud of. But I don't think any bureaucrat or management consultant would have designed what we have inherited. And so it is rather difficult for people who are not familiar with the history and context of this to make much sense of our existing arrangements. In 2015, Paul Mahog and three other key participants in the letter story, the Legal Education and Training Review, reflected not uncritically on the exercise up to that point. 2015, two years after the review report, still going on as all such exercises tend to do. And again, I agreed with most of what the four said, and particularly sympathised with their frustrations and constraints and their continual pushing against the terms of reference, although the terms of reference made a lot of sense to the regulators, from the regulators' point of view. And if you look at the handout, I've put it, attributed this to Julian Webb but I think it may have been all four authors of this piece, they end up with the model of a self-contained, time-limited, profession-centric review typified by Ormrod et al. and by letter itself needs to become a thing of the past. Never again is the message they sent out. And to some extent, I'm trying to diagnose why this should be. In 2016, Dame Linda Dobbs emphasised the extent of change in legal services and legal education, but mainly in the world of legal services. And in 2015, Becky Huxley Bins, in a typical barnstorming performance, anticipated two themes in today's lecture. That we should take student learning seriously in all its diversity, and we should dump the simplistic phrase thinking like a lawyer, because, she says, it does more harm than good. I have myself, on rather different grounds, criticised that phrase in the past, but I want to hang on to one idea, which is that legal education is something to do with thinking. Um, and so I don't completely want to dump the idea, even though it is wildly misused and confused. My standpoint today is that of a legal theorist, I prefer the term jurist, who happens to have been interested and active, in fact more active than scholarly, in the practices and politics of legal education in the first half of my career. However, in the late 1990s, having completed two books and too many pronouncements, I decided to concentrate on other interests. And the main reason for giving up was that I was very dissatisfied with not only all the talk and literature, but with my own writings about the subject. But I couldn't put my finger on what was wrong. So having dropped out for 12, 13, 14 years, um, the letter report caught my attention and I got re-engaged, if only rather marginally, to the debates that are still going on. And since re-engaging, I've given several papers, three of which are really building blocks for my argument today. The 
except I now think that none of them went far enough in the direction that they were charting. For context, I don't really need to repeat the reasons for thinking that we're in a period of radical, possibly revolutionary change in matters to do with the subject of this lecture and more broadly with legal services. Excited globalizers pound us daily with conflicting messages about the nature and implications of globalization, what is more precisely described as accelerated transnational interdependence. Not a sexy phrase, but you could call it ATI if you wanted to go in for that kind of thing. You're all no doubt familiar with Richard Suskin's Cassandra-like predictions about legal services. I'm told by educationists that it's foolish to try to guess what primary education will be like even in 10 years' time, and even whether there will be such institutions as primary schools. And then there's climate change and security and war and unpredictable economics and ro robots and Brexit and Donald Trump. And we can all probably agree that we're in a situation of uncertainty. Let me then go back to a few pre-1997-1998 light bulb points very briefly because most of these will be familiar to you before going on to some fresh ones um, which have started to glow if not flash um, more recently. Robbins, Hayward, Denning, Ormrod, Armitage, Hoffman, Benson, Ma, Acklet, Clementi, and now Letter. You know the little litany. One light bulb moment was to realize that it was a mistake to see these reviews as one off reports, which happened spas spasmodically. These were mostly exercises that lasted from three to ten years, and the names were attached to documents which were published in the middle of the process. And so we've had continuous review since, I would say, Robbins, <coughs> the expansion of higher education and so on, not starting with Ormrell. In the written version of this, I will go into a bit more detail on each of those events but I think I need only summarize them for this audience as they should now be commonplace among legal educators. Since Robbins, the focal point of most attention on legal education and training in England and Wales has been on a continuous series of official reports. <coughs> These reports all belong to the same genre. They're policy documents with narrow terms of reference and they've been largely oriented to initial professional formation, what we have been calling the academic and vocational stage. Um, I've already touched on Julian Webb, that maybe we should hope that the letter review report should be the last. My remedy immediately really doing, dealing with a theoretical argument, would be to set up or rather revive a so-called permanent National Institute of Legal Education and Training, slightly different perhaps from the Warwick Centre, which unfortunately got digested by an institution which itself has been digested by another institution, and which a lot of us, I think, regret the passing off, particularly the Lilly conferences, which created a community and dozens of networks among interested parties, not just law teachers. I think most people would agree that we've been seduced into making reports of this kind by far the main focus of attention to the neglect of vast swathes of formal and informal learning about law. And they've generated unsatisfactory and repetitious debates 
which have been largely unnecessary because there has been actually a very high degree of consensus about what they have been concerned with. For example, there's a pretty good consensus that the normal route to the bar and solicitor's practice should involve graduate entry or its equivalent. And okay, there's arguments about city firms preferring historians because they don't have cluttered minds, but um, that's a minor debate. There's general agreement that apprenticeship has been rightly retained and improved. But you probably remember that Ormrod recommended the vocational year as a substitute for apprenticeship, and that nearly happened. And then, not so much discussed in public, um, I think we could all agree, in fact it's a fact, that our graduates and our recently qualified barristers and solicitors are among the youngest in the whole world. And they've been generally less mature, not in a personal sense about the students and the young uh, qualified people, than the previous generation who had, because they were nearly all male, either fought in World War II or done national service. This is a point which I think needs more emphasis than it's been given in our discussions because there's something very important about intellectual and personal maturity and how that bears on making sensible career choices when you know about yourself as well have learnt a bit more about the world that you're going to go into. The main arena for disagreement has been the three-year LLB for 18 to 21-year-olds. There are, of course, other routes and some rather too few mature students and so on. And the weakness has also been generally recognised that the three-year LLB has had a ridiculously overloaded curriculum which is partly overloaded because of the nature and complexity of the subject today, but also generated by unreal expectations about what can be done in three years. I've been guilty of this as much as anybody. I used to, in a sort of Jesuitical way, seize the first three weeks of the first year in the institutions I was in try and catch them young, forgetting the context. Freshers week, and having before you as you're trying to rah, 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 and enthusiasm, enthuse them and have a good way of looking at law, that what you have before you is a bunch of hungover, homesick teenagers um, who, even if they're listening, are not going to remember anything that's happened. It's worth emphasising that even today this curriculum overload could at least be mitigated by making four-year degrees more common or the norm instead of three-year degrees. This is a complex issue which I'll go into in more depth in my, my written thing, but the typical reaction to that, it's not feasible. Well, it is feasible. And it's feasible for two main reasons. First, because it happens already in Scotland, and until not very long ago in Northern Ireland. I spent six years in Belfast, and I've ever since missed the Belfast four-year degree and struggled against at Warwick and UCL institutions that I highly respect because of what you couldn't do compared to what we were doing in Belfast. Um, but I think there's a second reason and that's the, the reason that student finance can't go on as it is. 
And whether or not government does a sort of half-hearted thing, or what, the, the, in the end, the whole question of funding of tertiary education and student finance needs to be fundamentally reviewed. There's something badly wrong, and that's some of the, re, gives quite a lot of the reasons of why we have so much angst in the general area of, of <coughs> not only um, initial professional formation, which obviously is a mess in terms of, of funding, but also in terms of <coughs> the whole culture of higher education. And I'm well aware that some people are arguing for two-year degrees, and it may be that sometimes there's room for that kind of thing for some people. When the issue really gets hot, and before that I would recommend to this audience, the case for making four-year degrees in law at 18 common, if not absolutely normal, is overwhelming. But the various stakeholders need to sing to the same him sheet and recognize that it's in their interests. It's in the interests of the regulators, because it's going to make some of the problems that they're struggling with um, <coughs> much easier. It's in the interests of the students, although once I did manage at Warwick and UCL to insert an opt-in provision so that anyone who wanted to um, could afford it, which in the, in the days I did this, there were maintenance grants and so on, so that they, they could afford it, could take four years over that LLB rather than three. And those provisions still exist in the regulations at Warwick and UCL. But they're hardly used. And the disappointing thing was the attitude of most of my colleagues, one of whom said, that's quite enough, why should anyone want to spend an extra year doing their degree? Well, I'll leave that as a question you can all answer. <coughs> but there's another factor in the situation, and we all realize that. Historically, law has been seen as a cheap subject. And it used to be, in places like Egypt, the dumping ground for excess demand for higher education, called in the politics dean and the law dean and said, hire some extra rooms, buy a megaphone and make more money out of your handouts. Um, and the vision of law as a cheap subject still persists. Um, and maybe it's not going to go away very quickly, but again, it's something that we could say, well, actually, things have changed. The time of the EU, joining the EU and thereafter, um, things loosened up in that direction. But there are all sorts of other directions in which that could be the case. And I think we can agree with regard to this succession of reports that the funding of higher education generally and of legal education training in particular has been neglected by most of the reports. It's not an issue that they have addressed. And the historic mistake, which we surely could all agree was a historic mistake, was made by the bar and the solicitors at the time of Ormrod. It was Ormrod's fault. They insisted control, having control over the vocational stage and thereafter. And they didn't understand the Treasury regulations, which meant there was no public funding for that kind of thing. I sat on the Armitage Committee in Belfast. Arthur Armitage, who'd been on the Gower, um, sorry, the Ormrod Committee, realised what had been done, and Queen's got a professional training institute with separate from the law faculty, but with public funding. And only recently has that been wound down a bit but Scotland and Northern Ireland have been much better off historically than we have just because of ignorance of 
treasury regulations in this case, but also not really thinking about the economics of legal education. Well, I think most people in this audience would agree with all those points, and it seems to me a lot of them are commonplace, but it may be that you will dissent from some of them. Well, fine. I, in the late 1990s, I'd arrived at these light bulbs that flashed, that I still thought that there was something badly wrong with the way we were thinking and talking and policy making in this general area. And so I note four further light bulb moments, although some of them were dim glows rather than Becky's flashing lights. Um, <coughs> First, like most law teachers, I had paid lip service to the mantra that we should focus on learning rather than teaching. We all said, yes, it's learning, not teaching, or learning and teaching. Um, yet my writing had been almost entirely about formal provision and institutional aspects of teaching and assessment. Even the word education, legal education, is a provider's word. We provide this for them. And <coughs> um, that's not what the mantra means. Now, educationists will say quite correctly that the distinction between informal is a very tricky one. I'm using formal in the sense provision of courses for which and assessment for which students are registered and the whole of the rest of the grey area between formal and informal and then informal um, in other ways fall under informal for purposes of this lecture. And I also paid lip service to the mantra that we should take lifelong learning seriously. Nearly all such learning is informal, even for practitioners, and even for people who follow law-related careers, except perhaps a few academics, it's very rarely more than about five years of the total career. And the question of that is, what does the academic legal community or the legal education community really know about informal learning, learning on the job, learning by experience, implicit learning, reactive learning, episodic learning, etc. There's a big literature on informal learning, but practically none of it is to do with law. I think it's symbolic that the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies and the International Institute of, of, of Education now part of UCL, are next door to each other, but I don't think they're on speaking terms. I did, for a time, do some work in the IIE library. It's a very fine library, but it had nothing about legal education. That was outside there, beyond their radar, as well as the lawyer's radar in terms of bringing educational psychologists and other kinds of educators and people involved in in formal training. A bit was done with letter, a bit was done in, in the States and with the Carnegie process, but I think in not very satisfactory ways in both cases. And we have now on the agenda neuroscience, which is going to make a huge difference to the way people think about education in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Um, so to some extent, we are unaware of what is already available but also what needs to be done with regard to the largest feature, the largest landscape of learning about law. Um, we just don't know enough about it. 
My third mistake was that I hadn't foreseen the extent of acceleration of the pace of change in education and legal services. It's accelerated. We all know we've been living in changing situations at the time, but Richard Suskind and others in other fields have been right in saying it's now getting up to that we can't really foresee 10 years ahead. So then there's a the question, what do you do? And the simple but important idea is that you have to educate for adaptability. Um, and then, I of course realized that at one level, but not. But then I hadn't realized the intimate link between adaptability, the idea of transferability of intellectual skills, for instance, and that that links with classical li liberal education. The more you're involved in change, the more you have to have basic transferable intellectual skills. I know that transferability is a big topic. And particularly in our context, problem-solving kind of uh, matters, um, which further makes the case for a genuine kind of liberal legal education at some stage and not giving up on thinking at 21, um, which tends to be what happens in our structure in terms of what is provided. If you've learnt by 21 how to think, how to communicate, how to read, how to write, how to construct an argument, etc., maybe you've learnt how to learn and go on. But the idea that that's academic and so you've grown out of it is um, an extraordinary idea if you think about it. Another mistake, less obvious perhaps, was that I'd had a dilettante interest in public understanding of law. And I had noticed in, more recently in the 2000s, that chairs of public understanding of science, public understanding of risk, public understanding of one or two other areas had been set up. But there'd been no talk of setting up anything about public understanding of law. There's been research which is directly relevant to this under different headings, some of which I think is very um, valuable on <coughs> um, not so much from an educational point of view, but um, knowledge and opinion about law was a sphere of socio-legal research for some time, developed a place like Poland. Um, and there were other law and popular culture, <coughs> is a sort of sexy um, one, which may not quite tie in with ideas about public understanding, which keeps changing its Level, t title anyway. I sat on a committee not long ago in which the name of our committee was changed three times in three years. Um, and public understanding was the final one, so I, I settled on that. Um, now, another mistake I made is I treated this as a subject apart. It's nothing to do with mainstream legal education and training. These are two separate areas. And I can see why people think that way and why I thought that way. But if you take into account the sort of Richard Suskind argument about change, can we be so sure that what we might include under the notion of public understanding of law is so very different from um, what we ought to be thinking and saying about mainstream legal education, learning about law, whatever you like to call it. Um, if you think about the number of people who um, have to know something, quite often in quite a lot of detail, 
about law in their work. Nice early piece of research about Glasgow sol solicitors and uh, how they found out about the law. And the finding was that they re read at most 15 minutes a week, but whenever they had a problem, they phoned up a local non-lawyer, a planning officer, or someone like that, someone who really knew uh, that particular aspect. And usually they were non-lawyers, they phoned up. And so whether Glasgow solicitors were un unrepresentative, I have no idea. And I don't know whether that still goes on, because now we have the internet, we have do-it-yourself uh, <coughs> law, we have automated programs for answering questions, and so on. Um, <coughs> the boundaries are breaking down. And at the same time, if one takes the notion of public understanding seriously, um, this leads us into a, another sphere, if you like. Um, when I captured the first few weeks, quite often the first year, of course, undergraduate level, um, I used to do the reverse of what a lot of traditional legal educators do. Instead of saying, you are entering into a new world with a different language and something totally different, and after three years of hard slog or five years of hard slog, you'll come out as a different sort of person. That's the sort of message that I've heard American law school deans give again and again. I come in, and quite a lot of you know that do something similar, and say, or ask, how many of you have never committed a crime? How many of you have never committed a tort? How many of you have not defamed somebody on Facebook in the last week? How many of you, etc., etc.? And of course, nobody dares their, raise their hand if they're awake. Um, <laughs> but um, then if you think about it, I used to have a Freudian theory of learning about law, which it starts in the mother's womb, and I think there's some research that backs that up with regard to Harvard Law students, that they tend to be <coughs> particular character types. Um, and um, so they've chosen law because they need father figures or whatever, sort of fraudulent account. And then they suffer great angst because the whole thrust of elite American legal education is to challenge the idea that law is fixed, certain authorities and, and so on. And so you get great dissonance there. But teenagers, how much do our contemporary teenagers learn or mislearn about the law of defamation or copyright or sexual offences? I think quite a lot of them would be exposed to this, not only in on Facebook, etc., but in terms of um, practical problems with regard particularly to, to bit, bits about <coughs> um, copyright and things like that. But Facebook and defamation seems to me um, a rather interesting topic about which I would like to know more. Um, now, of course, I would exonerate many people in the room for not having made the mistakes I made. I was tempted to say mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, but I'm not allowed to say Latin, so I just say I confess. But I think most of you should confess to having made similar mistakes in the past, and some of you may be still making the same mistakes today. That doesn't mean that we need to reject all our practices and ways of thought, but it does mean that we need to reframe the way we think about this general area quite radically. Now, if you look at your handout,
on page three, get worried with, with <coughs> PDFs because they don't paginate. You'll see a very crude table um, setting up three ideal types. What I've called for quite a long time the primary school model, which I would argue has been the dominant paradigm of talk and thought, partly because of this focus on reports that themselves have focused on initial primary legal education and training, initial formation and, um, and first degrees. Um, and then got moderated a bit by the reflective practitioner model so that having learnt how to learn people who go into work and reflect on their work um, <coughs> go on learning etc um, and then Lawrence Friedman's almost throwaway line that um, I quote at the beginning of my handout I lost. Well, I'll, I'll paraphrase it, but I don't know, but you have it in front of you. That life in America and in the West in general is a vast, diffuse school of law. Now, supposing we took this image seriously, just in order to imagine what a total picture of that this would look like. Not necessarily to set priorities or to set an agenda for research, although it could be very suggestive in that respect. Now, these three ideal types are expansive. So the second incorporates the first for the most part, and the third, the Friedman, ideal type incorporates the other two. So the other two are alternatives. It's just it's a broadening horizon and perspective. Well, it's important to recognize that these are ideal types. They're thinking tools. They're not descriptions or recommendations uh, and they're just to be used and we could have easily have a fourth we could have many more because ideal types can be constructed in various ways we could have a fourth in an area that I'm interested in which is framing a picture of learning about law in the world as a whole a mind bog boggling thing and one of the things we, I mean, this is part of the message of my stuff on globalization one of the, the points about that is we really don't know very much about law in the world as a whole. And we keep making pronouncements which have absolutely no basis in evidence, but also are conceptually confused and or vague or whatever, and jump from the local to the global and all sorts of other things going wrong with, with global talk. But today my, my topic is quite narrowly focused just on England and Wales. Um, and I don't think that adopting a Friedman type, ideal type, that it would be too difficult to actually sketch a rough overview, a landscape, an overview, not to make generalization, perhaps possible to have a few hypotheses, um, because quite a lot of the information about formal education is available. And what do we find? I know a little bit about this. Nearly all formal legal education in this country takes place out of institution, outside institutions called law schools. There's an immense amount of law teaching 
in all sorts of enclaves of our society. Some of it may be very boring, and a lot of it is imitative in a possibly quite self-destructive kind of way. I'll give you just one example of um, absurd ways of thinking that one comes across from having the wrong kind of model in one's background. I once went to talk about analysis of evidence in a police training institution. And after about 15 minutes, the person whose course I was invading said, but that's about logic. This was a course for detectives. That's about logic. That's much too academic for us. And so what were the detectives learning? They were learning the law of evidence. Well, I thought that Sherlock Holmes was the patron saint of detectives and that detection and investigation and inferential reasoning and investigation and similar things was the sort of thing that Sherlock Holmes did in a largely intuitive manner and that maybe detectives could be trained to do in a rather more rigorous manner. But no, no, that's academic. That's, that, that's, and it's too high for us. Uh, well, um, after 9-11, a lot of the post-mortem in the United States was about boiled down to a conclusion that the intelligence services didn't have the equipment to analyze masses of evidence collected partly by the FBI and CIA. And so that was the main reason why they amalgamated the two services. Um, they did some other things, but um, in other words, that sort of thinking and way, way of looking at things um, is rather different if we have the rather constrained perspective in talking about matters that are in the two um, narrower models. Now, I think even a rough democratic, sorry, demographic overview based on the Friedman image would have a lot of uses for all sorts of people involved in legal education. It certainly opens up huge and rather daunting vistas for new and or underdeveloped research. A um, great deal of legal education research, which you know, great advance, made great advances in, in recent years, um, has still been focused on, fits into the first model when you get down to it. Um, and that's perfectly understandable. It suggests that, as I've said already, we need help from other disciplines, other professions, etc., uh, who may be more advanced than we are in the law. Um, it could help regulators in a different way to pinpoint areas of high risk for clients, particularly of unregulated or elderly providers of legal services. And also for people who are providing a service, shall we say marriage guidance counselling, things like that, for, who, for whom law is an element in what they're doing. We don't really know much about that. And it's clearly outside the remit of the regulators we have been mainly concerned with. other aspects of the distorting lens of the first two ideal types. And in my written version, I will dwell on these at more length. 
But nearly all of us who have been involved in commenting on, advising, criticizing, being members of the genre of the Robinster letter reviews and reports have really been complicit in using a set of working assumptions which are very similar to the first ideal type. Now I want to end without spending too much time on it because I'd like to allow a bit of time for questions. Um, we're setting up a contrast the biggest arena of disagreement not the only one in all these perpetual debates has been undergraduate legal education and one of the reasons for this is that not only is everyone trying to pass the buck and offload stuff so that things get overloaded it's because people who are involved in academic law have a different mission from people who are involved in primary training and certification of private practitioners. Now, to show you how seductive this first primary school model is, let me refer you to Page one, bottom page one, two. A passage I wrote not very long ago, suggesting that regulators and academic lawyers have different missions. Um, and this isn't a criticism, a criticism of either. But academic lawyers are part of the mission of universities generally and the discipline of law is part of that mission and on the whole it is to advance understanding to disseminate knowledge and understanding but to advance understanding innovation if you look at two areas of public discourse that's going on at the moment. Um, one is various sciences, humanities and social sciences have been making a big pitch to say we're useful to society. And the kind of argument they use for that is radically different from the kind of arguments that are made in these reports. They belong to a different world. Law publishes catalogues. I happen to pick up Hart, but pick up AUP or CUP or other academic law publishers and look at the 20 or 30 fields, in other words, middle range categories, public international law, intellectual property, and compare that to what is talked about in the debates about legal education and training. It's lovely that some people should know about <coughs> copyright, even if it's teenagers. Uh, it's lovely that people should know about public international law. But this is in a different world from the discourse of, the, the traditional discourse of mainstream legal education and training as we have done. Now, I don't think that this leads to immediate radical reform, except for in some people's minds. Um, I think that academic lawyers have to locate their affirmation of their mission in terms of the kind of missions, statements you get for universities as a whole and so on and all the things that go with it like particularly in elite institutions and I could say a lot more about less elite institutions um, 
the idea that it's, which is what my institution, UCL, does all the time, that the great thing about coming to UCL is you are going to be taught by people who are at the frontiers of your discipline. Um, and so on and so forth. And it goes down and, and uh, all sorts of complexities lower, lower down. But um, I think that academics have been too submissive. I think they have, like I have, been lured too much into a narrow focus. And I think that there are immediate dangers and opportunities in the next few years as far as the narrow thing of, of um, post-letter debates. But it's up to the academic legal community to take this into their own hands and then not sit sniping at other people, but um, have a plausible case in which there are shared interests and shared things as well as keeping a clear idea to, to their mission. So at the very end of the handout, I've listed a few practical steps to show that this is not all theory, that the academic legal community could take at least to mitigate what is at the moment a rather difficult situation. Thank you. Does that work? Um, particularly if it's going to be picked up on the recording. Questions? First of all, that's now 30 years behind me, thank God. <laughs> um, <coughs> and in fact, it was a condition of my accepting appointment at UCL that no one would even suggest I become dean. Um, I'd done deaning when younger. Well, I would want, first of all, to have some sort of coherent idea of what the law degree in this context would be. I would, of course, try fight very hard to have it for four years rather than three, and to then deal with practical problems about how you attract students, a lot of whom may have the attitude, why would I want to spend four years when I can get through in three. Well, we had to deal with this at Warwick. Uh, the, the, the my, when a student asked that question, uh, or, you know, why don't we have a course on convincing, the answer is, why did you come to Warwick? Um, it's not what we're about. Um, and um, so you've got to really believe in the framework. I'd probably also, building on Warwick experience, reclassify most of the named subjects. So when I was chair at Warwick, I had to negotiate with Robert Goff, QC as he then was, because we had distributed torts in seven different courses. A lot of the torticals had gone off there to other things, but defamation had gone to civil liberties and, and so on. <coughs> and so over a very nice bottle of claret, um, we did a deal. Okay, it was called the 50.2% deal, which it was that <coughs> provided we put into the compulsory course of 
company law, duties of trustees and directors compared, we didn't need to have a full course on trust. We could have a half course on trust. And some of the discussion in the 60s about <coughs> classification of legal fields is still worth revisiting because I think people have lost, you know, the whole foundation subjects, core subjects, etc. There was a taxonomy which not everybody agrees with. One thing I put down there, <coughs> take the opportunity to say something about, is because I've been deeply worried about my students' career choices at the undergraduate level. Um, just didn't make the, a lot of them knew what they wanted in life, let alone being in a position to make well-informed career choices, partly because of their youth. But there are other reasons for making this suggestion, which is that I would have somewhere in the curriculum something which might be about the history, sociology, economics, career patterns, and future of providers of legal services, um, which would make a lovely subject there's a lot of good literature in associated legal work on sociology of the legal profession is still one of the most advanced things. And it seems to me part of adaptability is understanding your situation. And for people who are hoping to go into practice or wondering whether to go into practice, um, having some understanding of their situation and the broader context with some knowledge about longer term trends and so on, it would be a good idea. And one would then have thinking like that. But let me then just add, it's going back, Warwick is sort of coming in more than I had planned. Jeffrey Wilson, who designed the first undergraduate curriculum of Warwick, made company law and labor law compulsory. Um, in both cases, there had to be some study of some subjects that were foundation for studying those subjects. When asked, why have you made these two compulsory? His answer was, who can understand a capitalist society who has not studied company law and labor law? And he, when he said who, he didn't mean just lawyers, that these are absolutely fundamental, in his view, um, lenses on the kind of society we were in, what, in the 1970s. Um, well, so I would have ways of thinking about that, but I'm glad to say I'm never going to be in that kind of position of responsibility again. Uh, Nick Johnson, uh, also ex Warwick, Warwick University, uh, not the same time as William. Uh, whenever I listen to William, I, I'm immensely stimulated and find myself my thinking going off at a tangent half the time and then miss bits of it. So I, I apologise if you've covered some of the issues which uh, uh, I want to talk about. I wanted to um, just focus on your distinction between formal and informal a little bit more because I think it's a key issue in the thinking, and I, I found myself slightly irritated by it in part, because there seemed to be an underlying assumption that formal means boring and the informal means, uh, means imaginative. And I think that uh, essentially that what you've got within formal education, I know you, you nodded, you've uh, denied that, but it, it, it does, that there is a, within a curriculum, with any, uh, any legal education, uh, there is an epistemology which requires uh, imaginative thinking and application in a whole range of ways. So really what we're talking about with formal law and inform is really the setting, I would have thought, rather than actually 
uh, the, uh, the, the anything to do with the nature of the learning itself. And yeah, I think I, I think if you look at four-year degrees, and I'm, uh, I've heard these you're, you argue these points about four-year degrees before, that you can either look at expanding in a number of different ways. One is in terms of depth, uh, greater depth of the law degree. Um, maturation, simply because it takes longer, and I think that that's uh, um, uh, where informal learning will come in. But generally speaking, four-year degrees have greater scope. In other words, they do more subjects. Uh, if you look at Scotland, it includes a lot of the vocational subjects of which uh, of tax and, and litigation. Uh, <clears throat> and so you're moving much more towards a, a developed notion of being a lawyer rather than, if you like, a, a broader context of, uh, of, of others. Now, I think, you know, I, I think that the plea for informal learning is, is a hugely important one, and its range is, is important as well. It's, if you like, carry on learning or carry on uh, thinking, uh, really. And uh, there's a lot of white hairs in this room, I think, of people who have carried on thinking through their life and not stopped at 21. Um, <clears throat> but I think if you... If you're looking at that, that four-year degree in that way, those ideas that you've put, uh, the overloaded undergraduate curriculum, floating modules, these sorts of things, a wider range, um, there are opportunities which uh, I think within, we, uh, which are already there. I, I began my, one, one of my earliest jobs was actually teaching at Oxford Brooks when the modular course came in. And although the modular course was often castigated for being sort of colour supplement education, it did provide an opportunity to sample a whole range of ideas, a whole range of, um, uh, of, of, of cultural forms, really, and then use that within, uh, within the legal education context. So I think, it, 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 where do you do your uh, informal learning? I know your answer would probably be everywhere, but how does it apply directly to... Um, a legal education context. I think you're still hooked up on the first image, the narrow model. Yeah. And so you're still thinking about intending practitioners. Whereas it seems to me <coughs> one of the things about law is it's such an expansive world. And it, one of the things I if I had accepted a post in an American law school, which I've a couple of times thought of doing, I would have argued strongly for getting out of the league table model and developing a niche image. And the main one was University of Miami. It was only very recently that they had a single course in Spanish. They really hadn't systematically developed expertise in Latin America. They hadn't developed any expertise in the Caribbean. One of the reasons for this was partly that they aspired to be a national law school, so maybe 50th in the table. Whereas if they had been the center for <coughs> in which you could do a lot of the basic stuff, but nevertheless be the scholarly and, and intellectual and professional center of law in Latin America and the United States, they would have done something different. Um, so part of the thrust of this is if you start thinking about niche undergraduate programs, they might be related to some different sphere of work from legal practice. Um, I once went on a visit to Brunel when the Vice Chancellor asked us, gentlemen, because it was in those days we were all gentlemen, um, what is the role of a faculty of social sciences in a technological university. And so we went around, and it was a good question, and we went around talking to engineers and so on. And <coughs> it wasn't like 
contract law for accountants. It was functions of learning stuff um, about engineering. So we didn't get very far, but <coughs> as a way of thinking, breaking out of too much of a, as it were, the mainstream set of assumptions. Um, and you don't necessarily have to build up a huge difference to have a niche where this is the place to go if you're interested in such and such. And it may be to do with an aspect of legal practice. It may be of interest to patent agents. It may be to do with some other sphere of activity in life. Um, and so why constrain yourself to um, thinking about that? Now, of course, for all sorts of psychological, historical, and other reasons, a large part of the focus will be on legal practice. But in a situation where legal services are unpredictable what's going to happen, um, one needs to, as it were, be aware of the situation and diagnose the problems and then react accordingly. And one of the things would be much greater variety. Uh, yeah in the academic spheres. And then, I mean, there's just odd distortions, like letter doesn't mention postgraduate work. Um, postgraduate studies, which in a lot of places just sort of happened, they've grown like topsy, and they're some sort of market-driven, etc. Um, haven't been subject to any really systematic attention. And I just treat it as irrelevant to the kind of report we've been used to. They just don't feature. Um, well, in quite a lot of places, a third of the student body are postgraduates. And far more now from England and Wales. It used to be sort of a thing for foreign students, but it's, it's no longer that. Um, and so one needs to think about this. And again, postgraduate level, niche specialisms already exist to some extent, although how imaginative they are, I don't know. Um, so all I'm advocating is a way of thinking, not particular me measures. I think we've got time for one more. Oh, two more. <laughs> um, Luke Mason. Uh, thanks, William. That was absolutely uh, fascinating. So. I think probably like a few people in the audience, I was trying to locate some of the thoughts within my kind of uh, extensive reading of your, your own legal theory work and how much that's uh, kind of excited my, my brain over the last however many years. And I, I have a question that I think is a follow-on from the previous question, but trying to locate some what you said in, in your comments at the beginning about this is to some extent a legal theory paper. Um, so... I like the ideal types, the way you've drawn them out. And as you say, of course, ideal types can be drawn in all kinds of interesting heuristic manners. But there's definitely something of the, the, the legal theory, the legal realist within your ideal types, I think. You, you've got the kind of what we might call the, the institutional layer, which is in this primary school model. And then we've got these kind of parallel or super institutional layers, which are the, the professional and the, uh, and the freedman model. And, and there might be somewhere underneath, maybe an, an infra institutional level. So my um, question is really um, trying to maybe provoke the, the, all that work you've done in, on legal realism, but also just your work in terms of thinking ab about legal education more generally, is if, if we want to think about the idea that legal education must be about thinking to some extent, as you said at the beginning, it might not be thinking like a lawyer, as uh, Becky bombastically uh, uh, jettisoned, as we know. Um, wh how do we... Are, are, we look, are you advocating something which is, along these legal realist lines, a kind of a flattening of the, ins, of the institutional and para-institutional levels, the primary model that you portray and then the Friedman model that you portray? Are you saying that legal education is somehow about squashing these things together, somehow combining the formal and informal models? Or are you saying that they are two separate things which need to be combined in interesting ways but are sequentially 
um, separate or separate in some conceptual way um, or, or something else? I, I mean, how, how do we teach law in a way which embraces this kind of um, holistic vision of law that, that you've kind of portrayed here, but which still maintains a kind of a, a legal nature? My conception, legal realism, which I've articulated in a slightly different way quite recently, so I'm a moving target, uh, <coughs> um, is that if you want to understand legal phenomena of any kind, you need to have as thinking tools, concepts, you need to um, take value seriously and you need to have some awareness and grasp of what's actually going on and so the original legal realist things was law in books and law in action it's quite a useful it's a very crude distinction but it's quite a useful one and part of my commitment throughout my career is to get more action into the books but also more context into the books if you like but in other words it's an empirical di dimension to understanding law and the mission of the discipline of law is to understand the subject matters of that discipline which are legal phenomena of various kinds and you can have all sorts of jurisprudential debates about them but there is an empirical dimension and that partly comes from not accepting sharp distinction between theory and practice my closest collaborator over 25 years has been an American litigator. Um, and um, we were both students of Carl Llewellyn, and we both just didn't accept that theory and practice are two different spheres and you go off into a different one. So that is part of it. Part of it, I'm having drifted into law to escape classics and having drifted into law teaching because I wanted to work in Africa and there was no other niche for me that I was qualified to do um, I became a legal nationalist I think it's a wonderful discipline um, in all sorts of ways and um, much more exciting than philosophy or sociology or history because it is so related to real world problems and the world of practice and practice both in the professional sense and judges and so on but also in you know what happens and how people behave and so on um, so I have really quite a simple view which is I am now as it were spokesperson for law as a discipline and I did sometimes you know, earlier have to make the case for law competing with other disciplines in developmental context should money be spent on law in East Africa rather than on roads or, or so on, or should it get its share etc and that's making the case for you know why it's important socially as well as why it's important in the sphere of academia um, and so I really passionately believe that I was very lucky to drift into such a wonderful subject um, then quite often how it's practiced in all sorts of different contexts is rather disappointing because it doesn't live up to its potential the thing in your handout which I had a hand in drafting in the 70s I put that partly because it's a nice summary of the potential of the discipline but also because it falls into the trap of being influenced by the narrow model as was another thing in that in other words the assumption that law degrees are prep a part of preparation for practice will stop or mainly or even partly um, is very seductive and so all of us get 
pulled into that when we're talking about something which, you know, as I wave this around, belongs to a different world. Um, and we ought to be conscious of that and think about that. Thank you. There was one final question. Thank you very much. Michael Olatukun from the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law. And I guess I had a question around one of the wider topics which is currently um, doing the rounds in legal education, which, you, if you will, which is outside of the academy and outside of the formal law school setting, but out there in society. The role that legal academics and even perhaps practitioners can play in ensuring that as many people as possible have sufficient knowledge, awareness and understanding of rights elementary aspects of the legal system to be able to resolve issues in their everyday lives. Have you got any reflections perhaps on the role that the academy can play in our org organization at the moment? We're talking about democratizing the rule of law, but making it a practical and meaningful concept that people can actually use in their everyday lives. Any reflections on that? On my interpretation of what I've called the mission of discipline, my view of the mission of discipline, it's first and foremost about understanding. And I don't agree with the proposition the point is to change the world rather than understand it. I'm really quite committed to thinking that understanding is important. But not because it's detached from action and change, etc. I think the kind of thing you're talking about is a very important aspect of understanding law. And so, um, and understanding the whole way in which various kinds of ideology and particular kind, sets of values are valid, are clear, are usable. If you take human rights in jurisprudence, I <clears throat> have great difficulty with being committed to the idea that human rights have a, has a sound universal set of premises in ethics. But in a lot of contexts, I'm prepared to follow my former colleague and still friend, Yash Guy, in having, who, although quite sceptical the level of morality, has helped design constitutions in all sorts of countries in the South. And in every one of them, he's had a Bill of Rights. And he has a very pragmatic view about why rights talk is important, but it's a pragmatic view, not a sort of committed universalist moral view. And it works a dream in negotiating constitutions and negotiating constitutions that involve in countries which have a majority minority problem, which is part of the history of human rights anyway. So it's and but both sides in a negotiation constructing a constitution through through negotiation, discourse, etc., um, can use the same language to talk with each other about what would be a good constitutional accommodation in that context. Now, clearly this is associated with one's moral views and one's ideology, etc. Um, but there's also as it were, uh, pragmatic, and this is question about realism, right? Yashka is a very effective constitution maker. He failed in Fiji, that flopped. <laughs> there are quite a lot of operative constitutions that he designed. And part of the format for the design, lot, lot of, always taking into account local history, etc., but part of the format for um, <coughs> his designs was 
I think I'm right in saying every constitution that he helped negotiate had a Bill of Rights. Um, different contents, but nevertheless, institutionally, it was very important. I right. hope that answers your question a little bit. Okay. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I think we could go on forever. Um, but on that note, can I invite you to join us upstairs in the common room again to grab a glass of wine, continue some of the conversations, and to very briefly flag up two possible opportunities to continue this longer term. One is an event in Leeds on the 25th of June, um, and one is an event at the Open University in Milton Keynes in September, although I've forgotten the exact date. Um, and I think we will have slightly different conversations at those events, but touching perhaps on some similar themes. So um, thank you very much, William, um, and we will see you upstairs for a glass of wine. And